recording. All right, so everything is starting, is being recorded right now. All right, <clears throat> so I want to show you the program and kind of show you how to use it if you want to use it. It's good for practice, um, if not for anything else. All right, so I put it into my CISP 440 folder. It's called Random Bull. Okay, so this is the entire program. You can make it more complex. You can make it simpler, you know, any way you want. Um, basically, if you want to make it more complex, just make more of these lines. These are the ingredients of the um, expression tree. So right now, it is uh, expected to have one implication, uh, two ors, two ands, and also two nots, you know, in the entire expression. Okay. Um, and then the variables are, you know, I'm using only five variables in this case. So for those of you who want to start with something less complex, you can reduce the number of operators. Like if you're not ready to tackle, you know, some of these, you, know, you can take out one or, take out one and, um, maybe add another not, take out the implication, do some you know, customization if you want to. Um, and then the first part of the program is a, it's a tree generator, okay? So basically, I have these operators. I basically have a, have a tray of parts that I can use. So it will just randomly pick a part and go like, okay, let me see where I can put this in the tree. Um, if the tree is not constructed yet, then the root is going to be that particular operator. Um, and then it will have empty spots here for, let's say we, we have chosen an or. So now the, the or has two operands that are empty, right? So the next time I choose something, it will attach to one of the two arms of the OR. And then it will just, it basically every time you choose a new part, it will, it will attach to some random leaf of the current tree. So that would take care of all the operators. So by the time this loop here, this while loop is done on line 45, I would have a random tree generator already, but the tree is without any variables. It just has operators. So at the leaf of this entire tree, those operators have nothing to operate on. So that's when I have a recursive subroutine, which is called, um, aptly called, you know, fill leaves, okay? So the only purpose of fill leaves is to go to a particular node of the tree and ask, okay, do you have any empty operands? Okay, if you have an empty operand, I'll just randomly pick a variable and stick it there. So this entire thing is completely randomized. Um, it makes use of the random number generator of node. Um, I suspect this script will also work in, the um, <laughs> funny thing is, if you don't know how to install node and you still want to use this program, the best way, the easiest way to use it is to use it inside the browser. I'll show you guys how to do it. It's really simple, simple, simple. Okay, so uh, tree to infix is traversing the whole tree and generate the infix expression. Um, it will also take care of operator precedence. In other words, it will look at the necessity to use parentheses, and it won't use parentheses unless it is necessary. Okay, so that's the, uh, it has the logic to do all that stuff. <clears throat> and then when everything is done, you just have to, you know, call this function, your know, tree to infix tree, uh, it returns an object, which is kind of like a structure, and the text member of the structure is you know, the string that you need to see. All right, you guys are nodding, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so let me show you how to run this, okay? For those of you who say, I don't want to install anything, or I have a Chromebook and I don't want to install Linux on my Chromebook, which by the way, is really cool to do anyway. So um, copy and paste this entire program to uh, the clipboard. And in this case, um, I can do this. This only works in Linux, so don't bother to do this in Windows. So now you know, the entire program is on the clipboard. And I just need to go find me the uh, browser or a instance of the browser, a window of a browser. And I got one for CISP 440. I just need to try and find it, make sure that it's not showing something that you can, you're not supposed to see, like the grade sheet, like the grade of everybody in class. 
and then put it here. Okay, there we go. Open up a new tab. Okay, so this is just an empty sheet. Nope, that's not empty. There we go. It's empty. And then what you do is go, you press F12 to get into um, the debug mode of um, Firefox in this case. Okay, so yeah, I can increase this portion here. It has its own console, okay, which is kind of the same thing as what you get when you run Node or Node.js by itself on the command line. So this is just regular JavaScript in interactive mode. So for those of you who just want to learn your know, Node or JavaScript, this is really great, okay? It's an easy way to learn it. I can show you a few things if you want to. So if you want to define an array with one, two, three, four, five, and then you basically you know, do something uh, for each item in the array, you want to um, console.log um, got this, and then in parentheses, um, this whatever element E is, Okay, cool. Okay, and when you press the enter key, you know, it runs this. This is interactive, by the way. I don't have to enter an entire program into a file, get it to run, and so on and so forth. This is fully interactive. So, this is where you can stick the entire program in and run the entire thing. So, I got the whole thing in my um, clipboard already. Control V, paste the entire thing, press the enter key. And there we go. It just generated an expression for me. So if you wanted to generate another expression for you, you just have to uh, repeat the last command, which is uh, console. Oh, you have to rerun the whole thing because you have to uh, uh, generate a new tree and populate it again. So you know, um, but basically, if you um, if you want to. If you don't want to change the program, but you want to generate another expression, oh, what just happened? Okay, I have to make sure my recorder is still up. Yeah, it looks like it's still up, okay. So if you want to start the whole program again, you know, it's not really the best way to do it, you know, but you just repeat what I just did. Press F12, Control V, paste the entire thing. And now it generates a different expression. This, is, this expression is different from the one that we saw earlier. All right, so do we have any questions about how to make use of this tool? Is it, is it refined? No. Is the program commented? No, <laughs> because I just threw this together like earlier today um, before I got students in my office hour. But it is a tool, okay? Does it give you WFFs? In other words, does it give you syntactically correct expressions? Yes, okay, which is the most important part. Are we kind of do okay with uh, the tool? Okay, it has a lot of uses, you know, but you, know, you can use it for studying purposes. You can use it to generate random expressions, and then you try to turn those random expressions into C and F, okay? All right, <clears throat> so with that said, I am going back to the main site here because I will show you your new homework assignment. Technically, I'm not, yeah, I think the problem has to do with the um, connector. There's another one here. Okay, looks better. Nope, still flickering. Yep, so it might have to do with that wall, your plate. I'm, I don't know what to do because <clears throat> typically the problem has to do with, nope, I'm holding on to it and it's still, okay. Things just has to be. <laughs> um, right. So this is your new homework assignment, and I'm going to unblock it so you can see it. It is due after the break. Okay. So technically, you have one week to work on this, because you know if you say, but spring break, you're not. We're not supposed to be working on anything. 
fine. You still have one week, okay, <clears throat> to work on this. I'm not sure how what I can do to stop the flickering. Um, I hope it's not bothering anyone. Are you guys okay with it? Because if you're not okay with it, I can switch to uh, Windows, you know, switch to this other computer, which means I cannot record anymore. Which way do you want to go? Stop the flickering, but not have a recording? Or do you want to keep this, you know, but it has some recording? It, it's recording, but it has some flickering. It's, it's fine? Hmm? It's okay? All right, so let me... I'll try my best to make sure it's not on my end, but okay, all right. So this is the expression I want you guys to convert into a CNF. Um, this, ex this particular assignment description is kind of self-contained. It gives you all the rules that we have already talked about in class, in the previous class. So if you um, are not sure that these are the rules that are available, um, you can do exactly what I did last time with ChatGPT and just have all the rules in Boolean algebra listed. Uh, I suspect you know, that you can trust, okay? You know, ChatGPT actually does a decent job with that. Um, but I think this is the entire list of things that we uh, introduced in this class. <clears throat> and um, basically, you just have to go through the derivation and turn this Boolean expression into a conjunctive normal form expression. So are we doing okay with the homework assignment? This is it, that's your homework assignment, is just to turn this one single expression into a conjunctive normal form. Now read the homework assignment carefully because it also describes the priority of operators. So right here it says you know, um, negation has the highest priority, Conjunction has the next highest um, operator priority, and then we have disjunction, and then we have implication. Does everybody understand what I just said? Yes, no, yes, okay, excellent. <clears throat> There's also an example too, by the way, uh, in terms of operator um, priority. So this is just an example. This is not the expression that you have to work with. But in this particular expression, let me uh, kind of zoom in a little bit. I will have to tell the, uh, the lab techs uh, about the flickering problem. So with this one, you know, on this side, it has no extra parentheses because I'm only relying on the priority of operators to indicate the ordering of the operators. On the other side, where the cursor, the mouse cursor is hiding something right here. This one is fully parameterized or parenthesized uh, in order to show you exactly how the ordering should be done when we apply the operators. So the negation applies to whatever is immediately to its right-hand side. So that means it is not negating the conjunction of AB, it is negating A itself. And that's why you know, when, the, when it is per, paren the sized, you know, not A is in its own parentheses. So now you have, you know, not A and B or C. So the question is, are we performing B or C first and then do a conjunction with not A, or are we making the conjunction between not A, B, and then use the conjunction to or with C? So according to the priority you know, listed here, the operation uh, order is to finish the conjunction first, and then do the disjunction with C by itself. And then implication has the lowest priority, which means you know, when one side is a disjunction and the other side is just a variable, the implication is done last. Okay, so as a result, you know, D is by itself, and then the um, implication is the last operation that we perform. So do we have any questions about operator priority? Does everybody understand that when I do not use extra parentheses, you are expected to understand how to prioritize the operators? So we all good on that one? Okay, all right. Um, and then we just have the repetition, as I said earlier, of all the rules in Boolean algebra. Um, it looks really nasty because it's a lot, but many of these are kind of the same in 
um, normal algebra, so they should not be a big surprise. Um, we just have a few that are kind of trickier, like you know, absorption is something that you don't have in normal algebra. Uh, resolution is also something that we don't have in normal algebra. But your purpose, you know, you don't have to do simplification. I just want the resulting expression to mean exactly the same thing, but it is in conjunctive normal form. Okay, so don't worry too much about, oh, this looks really ugly. You know, do I have to simplify this all the way down to the simplest version? The answer is no, you don't have to. You just have to give me a equivalent CNF in order for that to work. All right. Are there any questions about this homework assignment? Okay, so let's just say that you're working on this one over the break. <clears throat> you did some derivation, and then you look at your, deri your, your derivations and go like, I'm not really sure about these derivations, whether they are correct or not. What are you going to do? Hmm? You can make a truth table uh, by hand. You can also automate the whole process. Remember you know, the last thing that I did on Monday. What did I do on Monday? The last thing that I did on Monday. Exactly. So I wrote a and what programming language did I use? Did I use you know, Lisp or Prolog or some program, programming language that you guys have no exposure to? Hmm? I did one in Excel, yeah. but I also did another one in regular C, okay? So you, know, so you can use that to help you. Now, does, that make, does it make it very easy? No, you still have to kind of convert you know, from your notation to C++ notation. Other than implication is not an operator in C and C++, everything else is in C++. So you just have to do a quick conversion between what you have written you know, in the derivation to the C format, and then you can use the program that I talked about on Monday to double check you know, the original expression versus you know, the expression that you have in your derivation process. Okay, is that okay? Because this is important. You don't want to kind of wait too long before you check it. You, know, you want to kind of check it like every two or three steps you know, just to be sure that you're still working with a equivalent you know, expression you know, or an expression that's equivalent to the original one. All right, so do we have all the tools to get this homework assignment done. Now, are you going to spend some time with this? The answer is yes, okay, because you know, you're new to Boolean algebra, so just knowing which rule to apply when is going to take you a little bit of time. So this is why I recommend people to use the tool that I just you know, showed you to work with simpler expressions first. You just get a hang of, you know, of you know, how to use those rules with simpler expressions, then you kind of move on to something that's more complex. Okay. All right. So with that said and done, we are continuing with uh, the main topic. Okay. So we're going to go back to... Uh, okay. So we're going to go back to uh, propositional logic. And today we'll talk about proof by contradiction, which is the last piece that we need in order to prove theorems in a very mechanical way. Mechanical is good, okay, because mechanical means, you know, we can use a program to do it. <clears throat> so we are back to the propositional logic module, and today we are focusing on the last part that we need to know. So let me just kind of give you the roadmap, you know, because I gave you a roadmap you know, early on. So at this point, we are done, okay, for the time being, we are done talking about CNF. Um, the idea is every Boolean expression can be turned into a conjunctive normal form, okay? We talked about resolution, which is right here. So resolution is a way for us to 
take two CNFs or take two components of a CNF and derive something that is guaranteed to be simpler than the original two parts because we get rid of one variable in the process. So the last piece that we need is proof by contradiction, which is a technique of mathematical proof. It is a very powerful proof technique, by the way. <clears throat> um, so let's go there, okay? <clears throat> so proof by contradiction itself can be proven. Okay, what did I just say? I said proof by contradiction as a technique of proving theorems can be proven because the technique is dependent on just a few things. This is not the proof of proof by contradiction. This is what we call a cor corollary, 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 okay. It's basically a minor theorem, yeah, which sometimes does not deserve to have its own name. Um, so let's go ahead and go through the derivation because this is a review of how to apply Boolean algebra. So that means you know, this review can be helpful with your homework assignment. Now, how helpful it is, I'm not sure, okay? But it is always good to kind of get more practice on um, you know, derivation of expressions. And if you guys want more exercise, I can go back to my CISP content and make a, you know, look at one of the de longer derivations. So, you know, let me know if you're interested after this. Okay, so this is the original expression, which is P implies Q implies P and R, whatever R is, implies Q, or Q and R, okay? So this implication, okay, this implication here is true regardless of P, Q, and R. In other words, if you make a truth table with three independent variables, P, Q, R, and you look at the entire you know, implication here, okay, this entire implication here, it is always going to be true, okay? So that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at this is, oh, instead of a truth table, I can also use Boolean algebra to prove this, okay? To prove this implication is always true. So these are the following other steps to do it. Um, I'm going to use the mouse pointer, and you guys can tell me what happened between the first and the second line. What, which rule did I use? Or well, definition of implication, very good. And then from the second line to the third line, same thing, okay? Because you know, I got rid of this implication first, and then I got rid of this implication. Uh, what about from the third line to the fourth line between these two? I did two things at once, which is usually not a very good thing, but those two things, you know, they're different, um, but both are not overly complicated. So we will focus on the left-hand side of this or first. What happened between these two? De Morgan's Law, very good. And then on the right-hand side, what happened between these two? I got, let's go ahead. Associative rule or, rule or association. You know, I just got rid of the unnecessary parentheses here because they are not needed because you know, whether you do this or first and then do this or versus doing this or first versus doing this or, the ordering does not matter. It's just like addition, you know, the way you add up multiple numbers, it doesn't really matter you know, which two numbers you add up first when you have a sequence of additions. All right, so what about between these two lines? Mm, another association, right? You know, because I <clears throat> basically I took out this overall pair of parentheses and go like, oh, we just have one gigantic or, okay? Or, wait, or, 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 instead of or, and then in parentheses, you know, another you know, bigger you know, or um, expression. What about, what about between these two? This is a little bit awkward, okay? I am using um, the identity of conjunction, which is true. The identity of conjunction, which is true, because now I can say, oh, not P is the same thing as not P and true. Uh, not R is the same thing as not R and true. So <clears throat> this kind of technique is a, is a little bit harder to know when to use it, because I'm actually making the original expressions a little bit more complicated than it was, okay? But there's a reason why I do that. 
So then later on, I turn this true into Q or not Q, which is actually, this is the rule of identity, by the way. And then I turn the other one into Q or not Q as well, okay? And then from here to here, I use distribution. So, you know, not P and Q is here. Not P and not Q is over here. Not R and Q is here. Not R and not Q is over here. That's distribution. So I apply distribution twice, but since it's applied to do two different sub-expressions, I can kind of do that without you know, causing a whole lot of confusion. <clears throat> And then I did commutation, okay, commutative rule, which means, you know, hey, I can switch the ordering of a bunch of ors, right? So I just you know, kind of reorder things a little bit so that it's easier to see what we are dealing with. Um, and then at that point, uh, okay, so from here to here, what did I do here? I think I skipped one step, which is factoring. Okay, so let's see you know, who has, which conjunction has not Q in it. Uh, this one has not Q in it, but it also has P in it. This one also has not Q in it, but it has not P in it. So when I look at these two conjunctions and I apply factoring, then I can factor out the not, uh, not Q by itself in the conjunction, but then the P or not P can be combined, okay, in the factoring. P or not P is true, and that's how I ended up with this one over here. And on the other side, you know, this one is also because of Q and not R, is, uh, and Q and R, these two are factored. And so in the end, I end up with this one here. Is that okay? <clears throat> factoring is the reverse of distribution, okay? So you just look at it that way. Um, and then at that point, <clears throat> we look at this one here is just Q. This is not Q. This one is just Q because of uh, because one or true is the identity of conjunction. So I can simplify this one and out of this entire thing. I can also simplify and one out of this entire thing. So now we have Q or blah, 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 blah. Uh, not, sorry, I take it back. So we have not Q or blah, blah, blah or Q, or blah, 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 okay? But the key point here is Q is not Q is a part of the disjunction, so is Q. So once we have not Q and Q in the same disjunction, then it is true. Now, is this the simplest way to prove this particular uh, expression is always true? I'm not sure, okay? But this is a way to do it. Are we kind of doing okay so far with this particular proof, okay? So this by itself is not proof by contradiction because at this point, what we know for sure is regardless of the values of P, Q, and R, P implies Q implies whatever R is, P and R as a whole implies Q and R. That's this entire thing is just a proof of this implication here. I'll be doing okay so far with this particular step of doing things. All right, so now we look at this and go like, oh, okay. So just to simplify, all we at this point know is this implication is always true. How is that, how is that gonna help us? So what we do now is we make a conjunction of all the things that are known to be true. Which set contains the well-formed formulae that are always that are given to be true? Don't ask me why it is true because they are just known to be true. Which what is the name of that set in propositional calculus? Hmm? Iota. Yep, that's right. Okay, so iota is the set. Okay, which is looks like just uppercase I. So we took we take all the elements out of iota. And then we make one gigantic conjunction out of it. So this is a big N notation that I use. And I just say, you know, take all the elements out of I and make a gigantic conjunction out of those. Is that notation understood? Does everybody understand what that notation is meaning? This notation right here, the big and notation. I can show you some examples if you want. Okay, you guys are nodding. 
but are you nodding to I'm understanding this notation or are you nodding to let's do some examples? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I have to ask those questions because the nodding is a little ambiguous to me. I'm not sure what you're nodding to. Okay, so that's why I have to clarify. All right. Um, okay, so let's do that. And to do that, I'm going to need um, my tablet because it's easier to kind of... Hmm, I'm debating what to do. Because <clears throat> I can do this in many ways. Well, we can use Joplin to do it. There we go. It opened on the, on the side that we are... We don't want it to open in. That's okay. Okay, let me bring it up here first, and then I'll do some adjustments. All right, so that's not the right class, you know, because that's in 310. I will put it in today's class and get me a new notebook and name it with today's date. So today's 0306. All right. So now that we have that, we can get rid of those two. Now we can focus. Okay, so let me define you know, X to be a set, and it contains the elements A, B, and C. Let's make it... Hmm. Let's make, okay, let's make this more relating to our example here. So I'm making IOTA to be a set, and it has <clears throat> the elements of P implies Q, okay, um, R and S, T, along with the usual things, you know, not zero and one and so on, but I'm going to ignore those, okay, because, you know, these are the important ones, okay? Okay. So is that okay so far? This is how I define iota, okay? I'm I'm forgetting, you know, I'm ignoring everything that has to do with the constants, like one and not zero. I'm just putting in the expressions that I say, don't ask me why, but these are true, okay? <clears throat> so now, when we want to evaluate the expression using the big wedge operator, okay? And, you know, in the subscript, I specify E is in I. Um, and we want to make a conjunction of all the E, okay? So we are looking at this expression, which is the big N notation that we saw earlier. So this is now basically spelled out as follows. P implies Q and um, R and S, and also, you know, the last one, which is T. All right, so does that help to explain what the big wedge notation is for? Okay, it basically, iter it's an iterator, okay? It iterates every element in a particular set. So what am I going to do with all these elements? Each one is supposed to be a well-formed formula, so I'm making a big conjunction out of those things. So is that okay? All right. <clears throat> All right. So getting back to the notes. Okay. So let me go back to. I I just got past that. There we go. So psi is nothing more than just a expression. Okay. It's a big and expression of everything in iota. Are we good so far? Okay. So that's everything that is given to you, and so psi should be true because after all, all the um, sub-expressions of this conjunction are known to be true. They're given to you to be true to begin with. And then we have a proposed theorem of phi, okay? So now the question is, what exactly is a theorem in, mathem in a mathematical proof? So can someone tell me what is a theorem in the context of a mathematical proof? Say that one. It's like a not okay. So that's a very good um, 
answer? The answer is a theorem does not have to be true. A theorem in the context of propositional logic means it is implied by all the expressions in IOTA. Okay, that makes a theorem in a propositional calculus system. So let me say that one more time. Okay, so um, let me go back to um, Joplin here because I think I can uh, refine what I have here to explain the concept. So let's say this is psi. Okay, so psi is defined like that. Okay, which is consistent with the notes, right? So now I can now say if psi implies phi, then phi is a theorem with respect to <clears throat> the iota set that we are given with. Okay, so let's just look at the sentence. You guys can focus on the right-hand side because the left-hand side is just the, the markdown notation. So focus on the right-hand side. So does everybody understand this particular statement? Given the way that we define psi as the big end of every single element in iota, if that implies phi, then we say phi is a theorem. All right, so there are a few key points that we need to understand here. Does that mean phi by itself as an expression is always true? The answer is no. Okay, your know, phi as an expression can involve you know certain variables and it's not always true. But it has to be true if you tell me everything. Uh, if you tell me that psi itself is true, then <clears throat> phi has to be true. Now, on the other hand, if you tell me, uh, I have no idea whether psi is true or not, then I cannot tell you whether phi is guaranteed true or not. Does that work? Yep. Yeah. So when I say psi is true, it means, you know, um, the entire expression psi is true. So that means, you know, uh, because as you can see, this particular psi involves um, a few variables. It involves your P, Q, R, S, and T, right? So there are certain combinations of P, Q, R, S, T that can make psi false. Um, the easiest one is to make T false, right? If T is false, then the whole conjunction has to be false. So when psi is false, then phi may or may not be true, even if phi is a theorem of psi, of iota. On the other hand, if you choose values of PQRST in order to make psi true, then if phi is also a theorem of iota, then phi is guaranteed to be true. Okay? <clears throat> So the other way to write this, okay, you know, this is actually you know, not the best way to write it. <clears throat> so the other way to say this is, um, okay, I'm gonna delete this and rewrite it, entire thing. So I can say, you know, phi is a theorem of iota if and only if and now we are going to use you know, psi on this side, implies phi. That's a much more concise way to describe it, and it doesn't like the way it is parsed. Right arrow, oh, I misspelled arrow. Okay. There we go. Okay. So this is a much more concise way to define what a theorem is. Phi is a theorem of iota if and only if psi implies phi. In other words, theorem proving has to do with implication. Can you start with everything in iota, <clears throat> go through a bunch of implications, and get to phi, I mean, yeah, get to, yeah, get to phi as, a, as an expression? That is the question, okay? Are we good so far?
This whole discussion has to do with what does the word theorem mean in propositional calculus. So are we good with that? Okay. All right. I can show you some concrete examples later. Okay. All right. So given this is okay for now. Okay. You know, we'll get back to you know, this if we have any further questions. So this is saying exactly the same thing. If phi implies, if psi implies phi, then phi is a theorem. Using the corollary, corollary you know, shown above, then we can say, oh, this is an implication. So the idea is, if you turn this the, the left hand side of the implication, the original application uh, implication, into a conjunction with some random component, then if you do the same thing with the right hand side of the implication, then the implication is going to hold. Is that okay? That's coming from the earlier theorem that we, we that we proved earlier. Is that okay? Okay, let me show you the entire <clears throat> corollary that we, that we were talking about before. This is what I'm talking about. If this implication is true, okay, then this implication is guaranteed to be true regardless of what R is. Okay, so this is important because now we apply that theorem down here. So this is an implication, and if phi really is a theorem of psi, then this implication is going to be true because that is the definition of what a theorem is in the context of propositional logic. So that means if I add not phi to the left-hand side of the original implication and do the same thing to the right-hand side of the original implication, then that implication would still be true, right? And I did say that it doesn't matter what you end it with. So I just choose you know, not phi to be the thing that I'm ending with psi on one side and phi on the other side. That'd be good. So here comes the magical side, the magical thing. The magical thing is to have the conclusion of if you take psi and not phi, it is guaranteed to imply false. Wait, Tech, what does it mean when something implies false and the implication itself is true? Okay, remember the truth table of implication? Okay, in order for the implication itself to be true, okay, so that's one thing that's given to us is the implication itself is true. But we also know the right hand side of the implication is false. Can we say anything definite about the left-hand side of the implication? That's what I'm asking. It has to be, sorry, go ahead. Also has to be false. That is correct. So that means <clears throat> when I say, you know, um, psi and not phi implies false, that means Phi and not psi is false itself. That conjunction has to be false. Are we doing okay so far? That is proof by contradiction. So in proof by contradiction, you are given a bunch of stuff that is just given to you and say, these are all true stuff. Don't ask me why, okay? So the conjunction of all of that stuff is what is represented here as psi. You're also given a certain expression of your know, phi, which is the proposed theorem. You don't know whether it is a theorem or not, but somebody said, okay, look at this expression here. I think it is uh, implied by psi, okay? So if that phi really is a theorem, then the conjunction between what is given to you to be true and the negation of the proposed theorem, this conjunction is guaranteed to be false. Okay. If you can show that conjunction is false, then you have indirectly proven that uh, phi is a theorem with respect to psi. All right, so that's a lot of mumbo jumbo, okay, a lot of abstraction here. Let's take a look at some application of proof by contradiction. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the pigeonhole principle is one of those things that is kind of interesting to apply. So here's an exercise of using the pigeonhole principle. 
So I'm just going to read a little bit out of my own notes here. So in essence, the pigeonhole principle states that given n pigeons and m pigeonholes, and we have more pigeons than there are pigeonholes, then at least one hole has more than one pigeons when all the pigeons return. Okay? Do we understand what that means? So I can draw this on the whiteboard. I don't think this needs to be recorded because I, I cannot draw pigeons very well. So we'll just say this is a pigeon. Yes, as I said, I cannot draw a pigeon very well. So we have a whole bunch of pigeons. So I'm abstracting the pigeons here. And then we have a bunch of pigeon holes. Okay? So we'll just say that we have we have we have fewer pigeon holes than there are pigeons. Let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six pigeons. So let's say we have five pigeon holes. Okay? The idea is at the end of the day, when all the pigeons come home, at least one pigeon hole is going to have more than one pigeons in it. That's the theorem. Okay? What is given to us? Two things are given to us. In, in other words, in this case, psi is basically saying we have six pigeons and we have five pigeon holes. That together is psi because those things are given to us. Then what is phi? What is the proposed theorem? The proposed theorem is at least one of the pigeon holes out of these five is going to end up with more than one pigeons in it. That is the theorem or proposed theorem. The question is how are you going to prove it? Okay, so I'm going to let you guys think about this a little bit of how to prove this particular um, theorem using whatever way you can think of. So you can use normal algebra. You can say, I'm going to write a program to look at every single possible way <laughs> that the pigeons can be put into the pigeon holes. You know, that works too. Okay, you can actually utilize a program. Now, we haven't really talked about combinatorics at this point, so I cannot really tell you, you know, how to compute the number of possible ways to fit six pigeons into five pigeon holes when you can have all the pigeons in the, into one single pigeon hole. But it, you can exhaustively test every single way of arranging pigeons into the pigeon holes. Okay, this, this is a pretty large number, but it is manageable. We, we know how to generate all of those cases. So yes, that is one particular technique to prove. And this is also why you know, computer science actually helps um, mathematical proofs, because there are some mathematical proofs where there are so many you know, test cases that you have to go through that having a mechanical way to go through those test cases actually helps a lot. But in this case, we don't have to do that. So because in this case, we can now say, OK, we'll try proof by contradiction. What does that mean? It means you have to negate the theorem or the proposed theorem. So once again, what is the theorem? So let's go ahead and use um, Joplin to kind of make this easier to read. Okay. So now we are given uh, n pigeons and m pigeonholes. Pigeon holes. Okay. Uh, you are also given that n is greater than m. Okay? This is psi. Okay, so I'm going to make it clear what psi is. So we'll go ahead and use bullet points. This is psi. And this is going to be a sub bullet point so that we know what psi is representing. <clears throat> now, the phi, which is our theorem or proposed theorem, is can be stated in English as this, okay? At least one pigeon hole has uh, more than one pigeons in it. Okay. So now the question is, does psi implies phi, okay? The question is, does psi implies phi? Okay. So are we doing okay so far with how this particular specific problem maps to the way we use the term psi and phi as discussed a little bit earlier? We good? Okay. So in order to use applied proof by contradiction, 
we have to first figure out what is the negation of the proposed theorem. Okay, so now we you try to answer that question. Okay, so the question is what is the negation of phi? What is that? Okay, so in other words, in English, okay, I just need the answer in English. What is the logical negation of at least one pigeonhole has more than one pigeons in it? What is the logical negation of that? Okay, I'll, I'll give you the first version, which is the easiest and the laziest way to answer this question. I'm just going to say it is not true that All right, okay, so that's a way to negate the original theorem, right? But it's not easy to read because it's just, you know, it has a negation and then we get back to the original statement. So can someone give me a cleaner way to describe it is not true that at least one pigeon has, one pigeon hole, sorry, you know, this type here. And the same over here. Sorry about that. Okay, so can we have a cleaner way to describe it is not true that at least one pigeon hole has more than one pigeons in it? I know this is, yeah, go ahead. Okay, very good. Okay, so that's a good way to describe it. So another way to say this is no pigeon hole has more than one pigeon in it. Okay, that's good. And we can also say all pigeon holes have at most one pigeon in it. Okay, so we're, we'll go ahead and evaluate these options and kind of try to make sure that intuitively we can accept that, oh, these three are really talking about the same thing. Okay, so let's evaluate these. It is not true that at least one pigeon hole has more than one pigeons in it. That's just from negating the original phi. Okay, so we don't question that one. So is the first one the same thing as the second one? Okay, that's the first question. So it is not true that at least one pigeon hole has more than one pigeons in it. Uh, and the second bullet point says, you know, no pigeon hole has more than one pigeon in it. I think they're the same thing. And then the third one says all pigeon holes have at most one pigeon in it. I think that also says basically the same thing. So I'll be reasonably convinced that linguistically speaking, these three statements are kind of the same thing. Okay, all right. So as a result of these three statements, okay, if all of these are true, we have M pigeon holes, right? How do we know that? It's coming from psi, okay? This is given, okay? You cannot negate this one. This is given to you. So, okay. And as a result, there are at most M pigeons. Does that make sense, okay? As a result of the negated theorem, as a, as a result of negating the fact that you know, uh, at least one pigeonhole has more than one pigeons in it, we end up with this conclusion of um, there are at most M pigeons. Because there are exactly M pigeonholes, each one can have at the most one pigeon in it. So that means you know, if you add up all the pigeonholes, there should be only M pigeons at the most. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so that's negated phi. So now the question is, what about the proof itself? Okay. So psi is saying, um, it is given to us, right? So psi is saying, you know, n is greater than m. That's given to us. Um, not 
psi not phi is now saying that n is less than m less than or equal to m okay uh, not equal to nope 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 it's less than or equal to le there we go all right so let's take a look at this one here and see whether it makes sense or not okay psi is given to us and in linguistics it says you know, um, n is the number of pigeons and m is the number of pigeonholes n is greater than m okay i'm just you know simplifying it here just to express n is greater than m okay <clears throat> not phi which is what we kind of worked with a little bit earlier says that there are only m pigeonholes and since you know the negation of phi says each pigeonhole can have up to one pigeons in it so that means the total number of pigeons is, is m. But since n as a variable is defined to be the number of pigeons, so because of that, not phi is really saying the number of pigeons is at the most m, which is also saying n is less than or equal to m. Okay? So now we take a look at what if I make a conjunction out of these two? So we take these two, and then I'm just going to do... <clears throat> the um, wedge negation of phi and then get rid of some of these things. Put a wedge in here and then put some parentheses around things just to make it easier to read. Okay. Okay, so is that agreeable? Okay, you know, just based on how we defined psi and not phi. Does that look right to you? Are we good? Doing okay? All right. <clears throat> and what do, what do we know from algebra? What do you know about the value of this expression? It has to be false, right? Because n is a natural number, m is also a natural number. You cannot have n being greater than m and also at the same time n being less than or equal to m. So that means you know, the conjunction of these two has to be false because one of these two has to be true. The other one has to be false. So that means you know, now we have a contradiction. Wait, hold on a second here. The What is given to you and the negation of the proposed theorem is false. So based on what we have talked about in regarding proof by contradiction, what have we just done? We have just proven that phi is a theorem of psi. It is implied by psi. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that means you know, as a result, you know, we just proved that <clears throat> psi implies phi in this case. So this is one way to prove the pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle is a very simple principle. Okay, Even if you tell a eight-year-old about the pigeonhole principle, the eight-year-old can picture, can imagine in, you know, in his or her head, in her mind, you know, you know, okay, that makes sense, okay? But if you ask for a proof of this has to be true all the time, it's actually not that easy. But by using proof by contradiction, it's like, yep, that's pretty easy. I can give you another example, okay? And this is actually true. <clears throat> Tech only has two kinds of socks in this drawer, okay? So every morning, I want to wake up and I want to go to school with matching socks. Some people like mismatching socks. I like matching socks. Okay, so the theorem, so what is given to you are the, is the fact that I only have two types of socks in my drawer. That would be your psi. The phi, which is the theorem that I want you to prove, is tech only has to draw three socks out of the drawer and there will be guaranteed a pair. That is your phi. Are we good so far? Prove it. In other words, there won't be a very strange morning where Takio draws three socks out of the drawer and go like, 
I don't have a pair. How is it guaranteed? Proof by contradiction. Can someone apply proof by contradiction so that you know you so that I can rest assured that if if I wake up in the morning, I just reach my hand into the drawer and go like one, two, three. Okay, I'm guaranteed to have a pair. So can someone give me that proof? How do you prove that using proof by contradiction? Okay. Okay. You have only two kinds of socks. Yes. And you pull three out at a given time. Yes. At random. Yeah. So there is well, there's only two possible kinds of socks that you can draw, and if you draw out three at a given time, and let's say like you draw out two of one kind, one of the other, you're gonna have a pair. Mm -hmm. you draw three of the same kind, you're gonna have a pair. Yes. And so you're gonna have a pair either way. Okay. Yes. So you are trying to look at it from a very intuitive perspective, which is fine. But from the proof by contradiction perspective, you look at the theorem that you want to prove, which is, you know, if tech draws three socks out of the drawer, one pair is guaranteed within the three socks. That's your five. So you negate it. Okay. So when you negate that particular statement, what do you get? Tech is drawing three socks out of the drawer, and there's not a single pair. That implies the three socks are all different. That implies we have three different kinds of socks, which contradicts what is given to you, which is tech only has two kinds of socks. That's a contradiction. Done. Is, is that okay? Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. So normal people would just say, you know, let's just say tech has uh, pulled three socks out of the drawer and it is there's not a single pair. That's how normal people would say is, you know, let's just assume that is the case. And then it leads to the conclusion that, but that means Tech has three different kinds of socks. But you just told me that he has two kinds of socks. So what you told me earlier is contradicting the consequence of the negation of the, the proposed theorem. And now we have a problem. And as a result of that contradiction, the original theorem has to be true because the contra the uh, negation of the theorem leads to a contradiction. Okay, is, is okay. Let me just kind of pause here because you know, is that logic intuitive to you? Okay. <clears throat> so as it turns out, this kind of technique of proving is super helpful. I can give you another example of proof by contradiction. Okay. So we let's say you're writing an algorithm to find prime numbers or to confirm whether a number is prime or not. Okay. <clears throat> So I'll give you a particular example. 101, okay? Is 101 a prime number? Okay, that's the question. Now, obviously, the quickest way to find the answer is ask chat GPT, is 101 a prime number? And the answer is yes, it is a prime number. But if I were to ask you to do this kind of in a systematic way, how would you do that? You go like, okay, 101 divided by two has a remainder of non-zero, so it's not divisible by two. Okay, let's try three. It has a non-zero remainder. Let's try, um, is it wrong to try four? Or is it just inefficient? It is inefficient, but it is not wrong, okay? So let's go ahead and take a quick look at what does it mean when it is inefficient, but not wrong? So in this case, is it possible for me to mislabel a number, whether it's prime or not, by trying a division by a composite number, meaning that it is a, a product of two other numbers, non one? So let's let's use an example. Okay, let's try um, let's try forty nine. Okay, which is not a prime number. So forty nine divided by two. Okay, we got a non zero. Um, remainder uh, divided by three, we got a non-zero remainder. We divided by four, we also get a non-zero remainder. So I am not mislabeling you know, 49 as a prime number because of the division by four. Um, if you have a prime number, if I divide it by four, I also guarantee to have a non-zero remainder, which means dividing by four is just not necessary. But it doesn't. It's not. It won't give you the wrong conclusion. OK, 
okay? So I would just blindly divide it by the natural numbers, okay? I divide it by four, okay? Non-zero remainder divided by five. I'm talking about 101 now. Divided by five, I have a remainder of one. It divided by six, it has, it has a non-zero remainder. I think in that case, it would be what, five as a remainder. Um, divided by seven, it also has a non-zero remainder. So in that case, it would be what? One, seven, it would be one, eight, what, 18 with a remainder of three, I think. Um, divided by eight, it has a remainder of non-zero. Divided by nine, we have a remainder of non-zero. Divided by 10, it has a remainder of non-zero. Divided by 11, it has a remainder of non-zero. And I say, we can stop here. Okay, why? <clears throat> why do I not need to test 13 and 19, 17, 19, and all the other numbers? Yes? So the biggest root, oh, excuse me. Let me, let me, let me try to formulate this. If a number is expressed as a product of two numbers, one of them is guaranteed to be less than or equal to the square root of the number. Yep, okay. That's a theorem, okay? I didn't give you a proof. I just get said, well, the, this is true, right? So the question is, uh, Tech, how do we know that really is true? So let me explain. Okay, we are running out of time, okay? So I'm going to, have you guys to kind of think about this. I know your spring break is in the way, but I want you guys to just think about this, okay? I only have to test up to um, 11 to confirm 101 is a prime number, okay? The theorem behind this is the theorem is given that, okay, I'm not gonna use your, um, the equation thing, you know, just to speed up the process. So given that P is A times B, okay, um, it doesn't like that because P is AB, and they are all natural numbers, okay, um, it is guaranteed that A is less than the square root of P or B is less than or equal to actually, let me uh, fix the other one too. This is the theorem. The question is, can you prove it? Okay, so we'll focus on this side here. So given that you know, P, A, B are all natural numbers, okay, so negative numbers you know, do not apply here. Um, and P is the product of A, B, which are natural numbers. It is guaranteed that one of them has to be less than or equal to the actual root of P, the square root of P. So you try out several cases, right? You try out some tricky cases like, okay, let me try A being a prime number and B being a prime number, three, uh, I mean uh, five and seven, okay? So three, five times seven is 35, right? So when you look at the square root of 35, it is about your know, six, but not quite six, but the five is less than that, okay? You look at, um, okay, easier case, three times five is 15, okay? The root of 15 is three point something, it's close to four, but not quite four, right? The three is less than or equal to the three point something close to four. So you go like, okay, I cannot find a single case where this is not true, but that by itself is not a proof. Just because you cannot find a counter example by hand is not a mathematical proof. A mathematical proof has to be conclusive, as in, we, we guarantee this condition, okay? So this is not a homework assignment. You got one kind of complicated one to begin with already, but I want you to kind of think about this, okay? How can you apply proof by contradiction to show that this indeed is a theorem? This, by the way, is your psi. We know that P is a product of A and B, they're all natural numbers. This is your theorem, okay? This is what you want to negate and see what kind of thing it leads to when you negate it. So we'll talk about this after spring break. Uh, you do have homework, you know, due 
on the Wednesday after spring break, but also spend some time to kind of think about proof by contradiction. So have a nice break. I will see you guys in a week and a half.